Thank you. All right. Welcome this, uh, to you all this morning for our 13th annual workshop on CHAM++ and its applications. Uh, so I'm very proud uh, that it is a 13th workshop. Uh, I credit all. I'm very proud of my research group that has been organizing it for all these uh, years. And I'm very thankful for all of you uh, for coming here uh, to listening uh, to us. Used to be a lot of show and tell for my research group. As you will see in the workshop program, we have a lot more talks, a lot fewer talks from uh, my group, so some more talks from our collaborators, and some talks from uh, uh, people who are not exactly collaborating on an application, uh, but topic, talking about related topics. Uh, so I wanted to do a technical, uh, a little bit of brief technical introduction uh, to the work that our group uh, does and to CHAM++, uh, and then uh, give you a bit of an overview uh, of the workshop itself. Um, there is a lot of talk these days of uh, moving away from MPI plus X, or maybe in con conjunction with or in addition to MPI plus X, uh, towards something that uh, is nowadays called task models. To me, ta the word task is so badly overloaded that it's a bad idea to uh, call something a task model, but it has caught on. Um, but what people mean by task models, uh, if I understand it right from everyone's description, is asynchronous, uh, uh, asynchronous models. I think that asynchronous models where there are DAGs involved and so on, that are useful, that's a turn we should take or at least uh, add to our repertoire. Uh, but in addition, we need to add, in my opinion, over decomposition and migratability as an additional uh, thing and uh, before we can get full benefits of adaptivity. That's what CHAM++ has been doing. The three principles underneath CHAM++ over decomposition, where you decompose a computation to a large number of objects, typically much larger than the number of cores even, and then, um, and then let the runtime system decompose them to a physical, uh, physical units. Uh, that's no, not so hard to do. You already do decomposition. You just overdo it, uh, like I like to joke. But uh, then the next thing is migratability. Um, that means these work and data units should not be tied to a processor necessarily unless you really want them to be. Uh, so let them be migratable across uh, nodes and processors. Um, that, means, uh, th that means an application developer should not address uh, things, messages, whatever, to processors but to logical entities like objects in our case. And the consequence for runtime system is it needs to do location management, figure out where each thing lives at any given moment so it can direct traffic to it. Uh, and these two things automatically lead to some extent to uh, asynchrony and message driven execution simply because there are lots and lots of things living on a single processor, lots and lots of uh, uh, messages or, or method invocations or, or whatever you want to call it addressed to them waiting to be executed. And so therefore there has to be a scheduler that will uh, sequence the execution between them and that leads to message driven execution and a concomitant uh, asynchrony. So CHAM++ uh, began as an adaptive runtime system. So now based on this actually, maybe this uh, slide should come a bit later. Let me just uh, show you this picture. Um, uh, this is the conceptual picture that maybe in one slide describes uh, the entire CHAM++ idea. You have processors, which could be cores or nodes, and there are objects uh, assigned to each processor. An object like that orange one uh, there wants to do a method invocation. It doesn't know which processor A uh, sub 23.foo is on, but it just sends that method invocation, and then the system packages it into that uh, uh, little dark uh, orange packet there. And it, the user simply said, well, here is where I want the method invocation to go. System figures out where that is and puts that in the scheduler's queue on the other side. The scheduler on the other side picks up when the turn comes, picks up that uh, method invocation, invokes the method on that object, lets it run to completion typically, and then picks up the next message from the queue and so on. And that running that method to completion may lead to other messages, similar method invocations being created to be enqueued on its own processor or other processor for the objects that live in the uh, system. That's kind of CHAM++ in a nutshell. So the three uh, ideas there lead, uh, uh, when you add in the runtime system introspection and adaptivity, you get an adaptive runtime system that can do all kinds of uh, wonderful things like dynamic load balancing, automatic uh, communication optimization, and so on. So we're not going to go into the details of uh, that here, but uh, this is actually uh, well covered in the years of uh, publication record in CHAM++. We won't, I won't try to summarize it here. We are out of time. The runtime system 
is uh, in, uh, of Charm++ plus plus includes supports for what we call Voodoo, what I sometimes call Voodoo's work units and data units, right? And so, uh, so these Charm++ plus plus objects are an example of a work and data unit amalgam. You might have data tiles, you may, may have pure functions, and those, those kinds of work and uh, data units supporting them, supporting location management, migration, and so on. That's one part. There's a data-driven scheduler at the core of it. And then that introspection framework leads to load balancers, fault tolerance protocols, and communication optimizations, etc. We have an excellent collection of uh, performance analysis and debugging tools that actually are enriched by and that are em enabled by uh, the, the, the richness of the, uh, the runtime model itself. I just want to single out one thing since there is uh, uh, no talk on that, I thought, and, and since I have a, a new animation, I thought I'll just show you uh, uh, something about fault tolerance. Fault tolerance is being seen as increasingly important as we go towards the exascale. Uh, Charm++ plus plus has supported it in production mode, at least the in-local uh, storage double checkpoint with automatic restart in a highly scalable way. We have demonstrated on 64K. There's no reason why it won't work on millions. The same, uh, same basic idea. Um, and and, and that actually uh, comes with Charm++ plus plus distribution if you download it today. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and so we have this base automatic checkpoint restart. You don't have to write any code. We also have an experimental proactive object migration. Say, hey, this node is about to die. Do something about it. We can vacate that node because we just have to move those objects around uh, to make that happen. Probably uh, more exciting uh, uh, in some ways and more sophisticated is this message logging idea. Uh, okay, so uh, let, me, let me explain that. Uh, it will be exciting or it will be useful. It's exciting and interesting. It will be useful if faults happen more frequently. We don't know that yet. We, people seem vacillating on that count, and engineers will eventually make it work well. Who knows? But if there is a, a fault prone, if you go near threshold voltage uh, and, and start making faults more frequent for the sake of you know, reducing energy and other things like that, and just by the sheer scale of things, then checkpoint restart may not scale. Okay. Uh, so and the main problem with checkpoint restart is it requires all the nodes to go back to their last checkpoint once one node fails, right? And so, uh, so, uh, um, so that's inefficient. So message logging is the idea that, hey, one processor, one node fail, let it go to its checkpoint. Everyone else continue execution as long as they can. If there's a dependency, wait. At least don't waste energy. And that sounds good. And then this failed processor, what does it do? Well, it is restored. The process is restored somewhere else, typically on a spare. And then it continues execution forward um, uh, based on what? It needs messages. Well, so everyone has to resend the messages, which means the messages have to be logged. And so they have to be resent. So someone declares, say, I, I'm resurrecting from my last checkpoint. Send me everything that you sent since that last checkpoint. And then you need complicated protocols to make sure you construct exactly the same state, because even with the same messages, you may not construct the same state. So, uh, so that's the basic idea. Does it help? Well, really, not, not really uh, by itself. It might save you energy, but the re-execution time is the same as before, then it's about the same uh, uh, problem as before in terms of you may not make any progress. You will continuously uh, fail and uh, uh, recover. But uh, with over-decomposition, what you can do and Esteban here, uh, who is visiting uh, us back, he is instrumental in uh, making this uh, uh, work uh, the, uh, for this strategy, is that you can restart uh, the failed nodes, objects, not the process, but the objects, on hundreds of other uh, nodes. So the recovery happens in parallel. And if you can make the recovery happen in parallel, in standard checkpoint, x-axis is time, y-axis is application progress. Normal execution is the black line. With uh, checkpoint restart, every time you fail, you go back and you, uh, um, you come forward at the same slope. Then again, you fail. So every so often, you're failing. This is, becomes your uh, new progress rate. It's a little bit exaggerated for understanding. What happens with... Uh, with the message logging is you continue on, you fail, but then you re, uh, recover in parallel, so at a fa faster rate. Only the failed objects in parallel are recovering, and so your uh, line uh, of progress is much, uh, much faster, plus the energy curve at the top, uh, the uh, power usage uh, becomes very small during recovery. Only the failed objects are consuming power. 
So I just thought uh, uh, this is the animation that I was speaking of. So uh, the, the surface of the cylinder represents the vertical, uh, the, the orangish beige surface represents processors, and the y-axis is time. So as you're going, uh, y-axis is application progress. So as you're going forward in time, you might go forward, okay, the application made progress. You go forward, application made progress. You go forward in time, well, you got a failure. What happens with a failure is that some portion of the system has to go back. Uh, but now, because the recovery is happening in parallel, this area surrounding it uh, symbolically represents all the other processors that are helping the recovery, and that recovery is that whole, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that entire uh, crater there that's actually sloped inwards. And so that starts recovering, and eventually that recovers and catches up while the rest of the application is continuing it if it's sufficiently asynchronous. And what's more interesting is that another fault happens, a second fault happens while the recovery is happening. That's okay, as long as they don't touch each other, those two regions. That is, the uh, processors involved in the recovery, specifically the buddies, uh, are not connected, then actually you can do parallel recovery. This is what makes it possible to make progress in presence of very frequent faults. Um, uh, so, so it's not clear that we're going to need that, but that's an interesting th uh, development from the uh, uh, that That's an interesting uh, thing that we can do, and CHAMP++ can actually significantly help there. So to review the last year uh, of work uh, at PPL, we had a very successful SC14. We had six conference paper, which for our group is a record um, main uh, at the main conference. Um, the CHAMP++, there was a tutorial. There was a resilience tutorial that we participated in. There was a CHAMP++ BAF. Uh, Harshita got, uh, got the George Michael Fellowship here, and we continued our tradition of uh, she's probably a second consecutive year uh, George Michael Fellow. Um, for, publication, uh, for publication areas, we had publications on application areas, uh, on resilience, on runtime systems, on interconnect topologies, on energy-related things, and uh, parallel discrete event simulations, which, which, as you might have heard last year, was a new pro uh, collaboration we started with uh, Chris Carruthers and uh, LLNL, and that has actually, uh, hope you'll hear about that uh, in the workshop as well. Uh, our main petascale applications made excellent progress. There's some papers about them. Epistemics, in particular, uh, was um, uh, 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 program the epistemics program from Virginia Tech, which uses Champ++, Plus uh, Plus, received some uh, press uh, with all the Ebola simulations they did uh, last year, uh, etc. So uh, Champ++ Plus Plus is now being explored within DOE for a variety of uh, future-oriented uh, programming model studies, and you'll hear about some of them as well. Uh, one uh, development uh, that happened last year that may be new to some of you is that we started a, uh, a commercialization effort for CHAMP++, so that's CHAMPWorks Inc. The, uh, that's main objective in my mind is a path to long-term sustainability of CHAMP++. Uh, it will, the, uh, the company will have a commercially supported version which, with its focus being 10 to 1,000 nodes, whereas the university focus will be at petascale, exascale, and, and beyond. Roughly speaking, we, they both will focus on, uh, include work on both uh, higher and lower ends. Um, and the existing collaborative applications will continue. The university version continues to be distributed freely um, in source code form for nonprofits just as uh, it ever was. Maybe we tight, uh, just crossed some T's and dotted some I's in the licenses, but basic conce conceptual thing remains exactly the same as it was. We're committed to avoiding divergence of code bases for at least a few years. Uh, and uh, so... Uh, even though Charmworks code base will be streamlined, we'll get rid of message logging, which we don't need for 10 to 1,000 nodes, for example. Uh, but uh, but, uh, but uh, the challenge is going to be keeping the code bases compatible in spite of that. Um, and your feedback on this is a very new thing we're doing. Your feedback will be appreciated. So at the workshop, uh, Martin uh, Bersens and Jesus Labarta are going to give keynotes. There are talks on applications. Uh, many apps, um, as well as other applications, uh, the uh, features and capabilities, we have a few talks on that, um, and, and so on. There will be a panel tomorrow on sustainable development of, academic, uh, of software in academia. So that's the overview. We are running a little bit behind, uh, and we won't make it up with, with your talk, uh, but, uh, but we'll just uh, shift everything uh, as much as we need to. Um, 
At this point, I would like to uh, turn the mic over to um, uh, Ed Seidel, who is the director of uh, NCSA, and lots of other things. I'm not going to attempt to inter introduce him. He's a very well-known uh, uh, person in high-performance computing. Uh, from our point of view, we know uh, him for uh, Cactus, which is another community software uh, uh, developed uh, in academia. And um, so I asked Ed to give, give a few words of uh, introduction and blessing to the workshop. And then so Ed, Ed. No, it's, it's working, I think. Just if I stand completely still. <laughs> okay. Um, so thanks, Sanjay, and, and welcome to everybody. I, I know you're from around the country and beyond, and uh, I think it's a very important workshop. I think from what I know of the workshop, uh, you represent some of the best efforts in this field, which is so critical. So I, I know this from personal experience. I, uh, I was once a postdoc, not in that building, but in, uh, over in the Beckman, where NCSA was early on, and that's where I really got my introduction to high-performance computing. And I realized when I got there that, I mean, I knew theoretical physics, but I knew almost nothing about any of the things you really need to know to do uh, the kinds of work that you all do. And I began to, to associate myself with people who were really fantastic parallel uh, computing people and people in parallel I.O. And, and so on, a number of people you may know who've come through my group, John Schalf among them. Uh, John John's a fantastic uh, person who did a lot of the parallel I.O. layers within Cactus. And, and so the point is, I really understand the complexity of pulling together efforts like what you're doing now. And uh, they're not very well supported. And uh, it's critical that they be better supported. And I think Charm++ is one of those examples that somehow over, I don't know, is it 20, over 20 years? So similar to where Cactus came from. Cactus came a little bit later. But the point is that these efforts are sort of strung together by different funding sources. And I know how difficult that is. So in the Cactus case, for example, I actually it really spun out of a, a, an NSF-supported project called the Black Hole Grand Challenge in the uh, early 90s when the Grand Challenge program was, was conceived basically to see could you, parallel computers are coming, we've already got four processors on Craze and soon we'll have, you know, um, thousands of them. Can you actually use them for science? And so they, they had this program where effectively the recipe was get some science domain, usually physicists or astronomers, together with computer scientists and see what you can do. And so, in fact, my project was widely regarded as a failure, <laughs> except for the fact that we learned so many lessons that the next generation, we started doing things much better. So I, th I think, m in my case, the Cactus framework goes back to that, driven by an application need. Uh, and then uh, I moved, uh, actually, I was so fed up with the NSF funding cycles and so on, I moved to Germany to a Max Planck Institute. But there I had the critical mass, the support, to build up an activity like this. And, uh, and over time, uh, eventually, you know, moving around to different places, I managed to string together different funding sources for it. So then, then I was at NSF, and the, the point I really wanted to make was I saw the importance of this, and so we created a software program, uh, the, uh, the Software Institutes program. Of course, I had intended that it be funded at hundreds of millions of dollars, and I think it's sort of puttering along at about $30 million a year or something like that. But, but there's a possibility that this will grow, and it will grow in importance over time because the machines people are working on are getting far more complicated. So already the Blue Waters machine, uh, which is, is not in the NCSA building, that's the NCSA building right there. That's where most of the people are who uh, work at NCSA. But the, there's a similar size building, not quite as high, but similar size over on the other side of campus, if you haven't seen it, where the Blue Waters machine is. And depending on how you count it, it has of order half a million cores, or you know even more than that, depending on where you're looking at integer floating point or GPU um, cores and so on. But um, very complex machine. and um, as we know, uh, we're going towards even larger machines, and the DOE has already announced uh, their uh, coral procurement with machines that will be of order um, almost 200 petaflops, actually, by, uh, by FY18 or, or 19, somewhere in that time frame. And they're going to be more and more complicated with more and more cores packed into smaller and smaller units, and you know, there'll be heterogeneity and, and so on. And uh, th so these efforts are, are yet more important. So I just I urge you to persevere. I'm very interested in, uh, at NCSA, since I've taken over the directorship about a year ago, in beefing up the, um, the research and education activities, and we'll be creating a number of applications teams there who are driven by faculty, and uh, they'll be in areas of you know, physics and astronomy or materials and manufacturing and, 
and, and things that you're all doing, I'm sure, um, uh, as well as um, the, the computational science efforts. And uh, I would like very much to grow the software effort tr uh, tremendously over there because I see it as so important. So just, so just some words of enthusiasm for what you're doing and appreciation. I think it's really important for the community. And uh, have a good workshop. So thanks.